All right, welcome everyone. For those of you who are here for the first time, um, I tend to teach straight through and I cover a lot of material, which is why you have 10 pages of notes. As some of my students have called me the king of quotes, I always like to start off with a quote. If the doors of perception were cleansed, everything would appear to man as it is, infinite. This is from William Blake, an amazing poet, printmaker, painter, and mystic of the um, 18th and early 19th century. This is a class about intuition. So in tonight's class, I'm going to attempt to cover all of these points. Uh, the three most common forms of extrasensory perception, what different states of consciousness are, how we go about accessing the unconscious. We're going to talk tonight about the language of symbols because the, the focus of this class over the next five weeks is how do we apply intuition to tarot cards, which are purely symbolic. And we'll talk about different types of symbols from the simplest symbols, geometric, up through archetypes, allegories, and myths. In tonight's class, we'll have a brief history of the Tarot. Different adaptations of the Tarot suits will be covered. We will touch on the use of Tarot in divination and what some various other divinatory techniques. So that's a lot of material. Let's talk about intuition. This comes to us as do many of our words um, through the Latin. And the Latin is intuitio. It means basically contemplation. And it comes to us from the Latin intuere which means to gaze upon. In intuition, looking inwardly for information. And this is information that's not available to us through our physical senses. So intuition can be experiencing a direct perception of the truth, fact, that is independent of the normal reasoning process. Intuition can also be um, information that's obtained not by reason or by the use of our perceptions, our physical senses. Sometimes we speak of intuition as being a very um, keen or sudden or quick insight when we have a flash of intuition or we say a light bulb goes on in thinking. And now on to a quote from C.C. Zane. Intuition is due to a process similar to reasoning carried out by the unconscious mind. And because from the four-dimensional plane, so many more facts are discernible than from the three-dimensional plane. If it is unwarped while coming through from the four-dimensional realm of the unconscious, it is apt to be a far more reliable guide to truth than clumsy and ponderous reason. He continues to say, it is well to cultivate the intuition, not only because it now may be made to yield such accurate conclusions, but because in a few years it must chiefly be depended upon. For after we have left the physical body behind, reason, which is dependent upon physical brain cells, can no longer offer guidance. This comes from the book Esoteric Psychology in the Brotherhood of Light series. So the main reason behind our developing intuition, on one hand, it can offer great 
practical guidance while here on Earth. But ultimately, these are the methods of understanding and perception when we pass from the physical to the inner plane. Something we're all dying to do. Let's talk about extrasensory perception because this is another common name that's used for intuition. All intuition generally utilizes extrasensory perception here on out ESP. ESP is the act of acquiring information through channels other than physical senses and the commonly recognized processes of the mind. They're active in the 30s and 40s. The Church of Light ESP Research Department determined that there were three, um, three information from extrasensory sources, and they are mediumship, feeling extrasensory perception, and intellectual extrasensory perception. So in tonight's class, we're going to break these three concepts down and see how they are used. Now, medium, um, mediums are psychic practitioners who mediate communication between human beings and the non-physical world. And this is a very important form of extrasensory perception because it is actually one of the oldest known forms. Uh, throughout human history, the practice has been associated with various religious belief systems, such as shamanic rituals among Native American and Arctic tribes. Uh, the Balinese Pasupati ceremonies, uh, the West African Orisha traditions, which through the African diaspora um, entered into the New World in the form of Vudun, Santeria, and Candomblé. And since the mid 19th century, through spiritualism. So, friendship is a very um, widely used form of extrasensory perception. And it is quite likely that trance rituals are among the oldest forms of human ritualistic expression. Now, most trance rituals involve a discarnate spirit possession of the medium or the use of the medium's voice or body during a sitting, which is called a seance. This is oftentimes brought about through rhythmic dance or drumming. And that is used to um, create a trance-like state. So you can see here in these pictures, this is a candomblé ceremony in Brazil, in Bahia. And uh, this is a shaman of a Siberian tribe where drumming is used to create the altered state. We're not really sure how that works, um, the ability to create an So, a big part of many different um, ceremonies. Now, States of trance are sometimes referred to as channeling. Channeling does not always mean spirit possession. It can loosely refer to any practice such as telepathy, spirit communication, automatic writing, etc., where the individual becomes the medium or the channel for out. And he old spirit photograph from the late 19th century. All right. Uh, seance is French. And it literally means a sitting. And seance is 
societies that are brought together to basically bring about normal phenomena. It was, they were very big, um, well, in the 18th and 19th century and in the mid 19th century around uh, 1848, the birth of spiritualism came about. And this was a hugely um, powerful cultural movement. So many of the major changes that happened in the 19th century that, that impact us socially today, uh, primarily um, uh, social movements such as abolition of slavery and women's suffrage were brought about by spiritualist um, speakers who would travel around the country not only talking about the, their visions of the inner world, sometimes producing psychic phenomena or spirit communion, but also bringing through these more advanced social ideas to help bring about um, change within our country. So, a wide variety of um, phenomena can be produced during spirit trance, things such as apportations. I've had people report, you know, you know, rocks falling into their hand, keys, other um, objets, uh, automatic writing. Ectoplasm is not something we hear about much in the 21st century, but back in the late 19th century and the first half of the 20th century, these were um, plasms produced from the bodies of mediums during seances and trances. There were r reported levitations, spirit wrappings, trumpet mediums, um, and spirit slates, which were two pieces of slate where a piece of chalk would be placed between the two of them and the spirit would move the chalk making um, either writing or symbols on the slates. So those are just some of the uh, psychic phenomena that can be produced um, through mediumship. Now, the other thing that was going on, all of you probably remember Houdini, um, if, if nothing else, he is a figure from the 20th century that is memorialized. And what happened in the past is this became a really big movement. And much like the circus, uh, people found that the, you know, the greatest showmanship could also attract the greatest number of followers. And what happened over times is photographs were being um, falsified. Uh, there were much like magic tricks. There were things being done, tricks to make tables move and uh, sounds and things fall. So within this community, there actually became a lot of um, uh, fraudulent performances going on. So Houdini was a very active debunker he stated he did not oppose the religion of spiritualism itself, but only the trickery. So mediumship developed a bad name for itself. And although mediumship can produce remarkable psychic phenomena, in the Brotherhood of Light, it's actually not considered to be a safe method of psychic development. So we primarily discourage its use. And that has actually not always been the case. When the books were first written back, starting around 1912, uh, the very first of the Brotherhood of Light lessons was called The Laws of Mediumship. And um, again, at the time when the books were written, Zane came up strongly through a spiritualist community and it really wasn't until the th mid 30s and 40s that through the Brotherhood of Light ESP research department, they were continually looking for the safest and the most effective way to develop one's extrasensory perception. And 
the organization moved um, away from more mediumistic forms of acquiring information. What happens? Basically, over time, by allowing a spirit or entity or another intelligence um, to enter your body, the individual will starts to break down. And it can, at that point, uh, to some degree, a medium has less ability to close the door. And so they become vulnerable to undesirable psychic influences. That's probably the um, you know, greatest disadvantage in all of this, which is why we don't encourage it. If you think about it in our waking states, we try not to be dominated by religious authorities or political authorities or advertising authorities. Many of us train our minds to, you know, reject the messages that we're constantly being bombarded with. And to a, a degree in mediumship, all of that starts to break down. Now, the point of concern about mediumship is called quality control. Just because somebody has died and passed to the inner plane does not necessarily that they are the you know, fount of all knowledge or wisdom. Basically, when we leave this plane, we go to a realm that's very similar to our vibratory rate, the character that was developed up to that point. And only as we move through higher planes of existence do we have access to um, more rarefied or more spiritual information. So the thing in mediumship is one cannot always govern or select the intelligence that's going to come through at any given period of time. It has to also sometimes take certain information with a grain of salt. When um, yeah, that's what we'll say about that. So if you have any questions on mediumship, we'll talk about it at the end of the evening. We'll move on to feeling extrasensory perception. And um, some persons have this more prominent than others. And when we start talking about our different physical senses and their um, spiritual or their astral counterparts, uh, we'll get to see which ones we use the most. But in feeling extrasensory perception, it utilizes the hypersensitivity of the nervous system. So what happens is persons with prominent feeling ESP tune into the astral counterparts of the object or person that they are seeking to get information about. What happens with prominent feeling extrasensory perception, and this is my dominant um, ESP sense, is the, the person with prominent feeling ESP becomes much like a radio set, <clears throat> which means they are continually picking up the waves that are broadcast around them. Um, you know, there are challenges like that. I mean, is there anyone that doesn't like rap? Yeah, if you go down the street and you hear somebody with their speakers up really loud and it's boom, 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 and it's, you know, shouting angry things out at you, you may not always want to hear that. They're not going to roll their windows up, but you might choose to roll your windows up. Or if you're of the younger generation, that may be the music you love. Um, when I was a kid, we played rock and roll really loud on what was called a record player, um, rarely in existence. And when I was really young, we had a Victrola. So um, <laughs> things would go at 33 and a third or 45 or I think 78, yeah. <laughs> so technology has changed. But we all have different um, taste of what we want to be tuned into musically. It's the same with um, psychic vibrations. 
there are things that we may find agreeable and things we may find disagreeable um, when we're working with feeling ESP. So the individual empathetically feels the condition. You know, yes, Paul. Are we switching? Can I put it here? Oh. All right. for sound. Do we have bars? Great. All right. Have any of you ever had somebody enter the room and your back starts aching and later on they tell you they're having a backache or they arrive with a headache and you start to get a headache or you start to feel some anxiety or other such things. Feeling as ESP mirrors oftentimes what's going on with the other person, or if you're tuning into an object of some kind, you can pick up on what's happening. In my work, I more often than not am dealing with people in great states of distress. Um, so, Tuning into those conditions has a great disadvantage because when you enter into rapport with someone through feeling ESP, um, you're basically taking on the same conditions that they're experiencing. So if you work with a lot of troubled people, it could be like watching, you know, five horror flicks in a day. Now, um, one of the advantages of ESP is it does not require um, contact with unseen intelligences or any disincarnate entities. The biggest disadvantages are basically tapping into the pains of conditions. Um, the biggest problem is being able to disengage. Now, one way to think of this is if any of you have ever gone out to coffee with a friend who the entire time vented and didn't really give you a chance to, you know, respond, advise, counsel, or give something in return, they leave and you spend the rest of the day feeling jangled. Has that ever happened to anyone here? Okay. What happens with feeling ESP is once you tune into a vibration, it can be very hard to disengage. It's almost like Velcro. You know, it, it finds a hook and it catches on. So this is something um, you have to be careful of. And continued use of feeling ESP for somebody who does, you know, consultation after consultation with other people using this sense it can actually leave them physically, emotionally, psychically drained. Now to be successful with feeling ESP, the practitioner um, must develop the ability to redirect his or her consciousness once they start to feel mired in the condition of the other person. And that actually takes some degree of training to do. So the third form of ESP is called intellectual ESP. And it is the experience of being a detached and unemotional observer of a condition. And the way I like to describe this process if I'm ever watching a I do, you can't do this at the theater, but if you're ever watching a movie at home 
and there are you know scary scenes in it or horror scenes there certainly is the fast forward button or what's almost equally as effective is the mute button and what you will notice is when you're listening to the music you're dialed into it in a feeling emotional way once the music is off the score is off the shrieks the sounds the you know the thuds the blows the shrieking of wheels and brakes go you're just seeing the images go by and it's a much more detached um, role of an observer so I, I try to compare intellectual ESP to that process whereas feeling ESP is watching the video with the sound turned up so with this um, hypersensitivity hypersensitivity plays no part in intellectual ESP instead of becoming a receiving set as one does with feeling ESP the electrical energies of the nervous system radiate a high frequency vibrations which provide the intuitive senses of the unconscious mind with sufficient energy to perform their work and we're going to talk shortly about how that happens the process of intellectual ESP um, the unconscious mind or the astral brain functions on the inner plane and it examines objects thought forms and it can communicate with other intelligences but it does so in a way where they're not being invited in much as you may have had the experience of being with a friend and saying the same thing at the same time <coughs> it's it's that form of communication and the Church of Light considers intellectual ESP to be the safest and most effective form of psychic development so we you know strongly um, support that in the work that we do and over the next few weeks we'll be talking about how that's used when we uh, work with tarot cards as our our instrument of divination and in the future I may call it intellectual ESP or I may refer to it as extension of consciousness the reason we do that is during the practice of intellectual ESP we extend our consciousness out from its normal position in the physical brain and we move it to the inner plane where we're able to gather information so let's talk a little bit about states of consciousness or actually let's move to physical perceptions this may not be in your notes might end up in next week's notes because I started uh, moving slides around after putting the handouts together what are our physical senses sight sound sense taste and touch well we have corresponding psychic senses to each of our physical senses and um, for sight we have clairvoyance sound clairaudience sense we have uh, clair olfaction uh, taste clair gustance and touch can be called clair sentience or sometimes psychometry as another older term for that so let's talk about the psychic sense of sight uh, clair a lot of these terms entered English from the French which is derivative of Latin so clair means clear or light and voyance means vision and clairvoyance is the ability to gain information about an object person location physical event through the psychic sense of sight often what happens is on the mind of the reader on the mind of the intuitive they're actually seeing pictures images or they may be seeing that film footage uh, being shown and they may be seeing events in the future or events from the past or one can see events that are happening 
contemporaneously, but in another location. So, a clairvoyant is one who sees clearly. And clairvoyance can include, um, as I just described, precognition or retrocognition. Precognition is seeing something before it happens. Retro is seeing something after it has happened. Remote viewing is one of the things that was um, studied in different ESP or uh, parapsychological departments of universities. And I've spoken to people in the past that also worked in different government agencies. There was a time during the Cold War where both here in the US there were departments set up to exploit these psychic senses and in the Soviet Union at that time this is something that was um, definitely funded. The distance that we're looking at things can either be in time, forwards or backwards, or in space, something happening at a distance. Claire audience, again, it's 17th century French, clear hearing. So clear audience is the ability to hear in a paranormal manner. Um, this is when you are not schizophrenic and you hear voices. <laughs> and you know they're not the voice of your own inner thinking. Because we know the voices that we use in conversation in our own minds. But there are also other voices that we can, through clairaudience, detect are outside of ourselves where we're getting information. So in the intuitive process, this is something that can happen to people. You could be walking down the street and nearly jump because you hear a voice and you're looking around for who was behind you or whispering in your ear. Or you may be sitting and doing a reading for someone and you could be hearing a conversation, not necessarily in your ear, but a conversation playing itself out upon your, your inner mind. So that's how clairaudience work. Uh, may include actual perception of sounds such as voices, tones, noises, which are not apparent to other humans or perceptible to recording equipment. And this may include the voices of spirits or the deceased or um, people have reported hearing the music of the spheres. Mozart and Beethoven two great classical artists used to actually hear their concertos being played out and they were working as scribes trying to rapidly write them down. Mozart even claimed that, that once he did that he rarely ever changed a note. Clair alliance or clair olfaction. This is the psychic sense of scent. Again, French clair clear, alliance smelling. So, um, most frequently, this is the way that spirits get our attention. Unbeknownst to you, some, you know, your great aunt Tilly dies in Massachusetts and you smell her white shoulders perfume in while well, you're having your coffee that morning and it makes you think of her and you get a call later that day to let you know she's passed on. She however made it there first. So quite often um, when spirits do come to visit us they announce themselves. If your Uncle George um, smoked fat Cuban cigars, that may be what you smell before he makes his presence known. So this is again, it's a physical sense that has a um, 
astral counterpart. <coughs> Claire Gustas. Unless you speak a Romance language, Spanish for example, when we want to say we like something, we say me gusta. And basically you're not saying I like it, you're saying it's to my taste. So gustas comes to us from the Latin taste. And think about it. You may have talked about someone and, and you meet for the first time and you might say, oh, they left a bad taste in my mouth. <laughs> or you might be in a situation and you could get a um, strongly metallic taste or something acrid or bitter. So oftentimes we, we perceive through Claire Gustance, much as our sense of taste is very limited to you know, bitter, um, salty, sweet, and sour, through that, primarily, that psychic sense, what we pull in are basic tones of a situation. Unlike clairvoyance or clairaudience, where we might be able to you know, see the whole picture or hear the story unfold, we just um, can get a sense of whether something is inimical to us or whether it's friendly to us. And clairsentience, also known as psychometry, is a psychic sense of touch. And um, psychometry is psyche or soul and metron measurement, which comes to us from the Greek. And persons with um, clairsentience are oftentimes used um, in detective work where they may be brought, you know, much like we give clothes of a victim to a bloodhound to smell and track a body. Psychics with strong clairsentience can feel objects and talk about the history, what happened, what they see um, going on. But again, oftentimes clairsentience ties one into a very powerful feeling, ESP. Though for some, they will see things unfold as images. So one could pick up the, you know, the ring of one's deceased great-grandmother and, and give a character reading about that person, or determine you know, how someone died um, through touching their you know, clothes. So, this takes us into looking at uh, states of consciousness. In the study of psychology, the human mind has three distinct parts. The conscious mind, the subconscious mind, and the superconscious mind. Now, the subconscious and superconscious minds in the Brotherhood of Light lessons are jointly categorized as the unconscious mind because they operate in a non-physical realm and they are interrelated to one another. So the conscious mind is directly connected to the physical brain and the perceptions of our sensory organs. And the conscious mind is responsible for logic, reasoning, voluntary perceptions, reading, writing, speaking, listening, etc. all engages the conscious mind. Anything that we are learning for the first time, such as my learning to use this particular remote to go backwards or forwards, um, Barb having to learn how to switch between the screen and or the camera which is on me, these are things that are being learned for the new t first time, and this is strongly engaging the conscious mind. Now, the conscious mind can be the portal to the subconscious mind, 
And one of the things we learn in metaphysics is that our consciousness goes to wherever we hold our attention. And that can be used to our advantage. Quite often it's used to our disadvantage. All right, the unconscious mind is comprised of both the subconscious and the superconscious minds. Uh, the subconscious mind is a storehouse of our learned behavior, beliefs, feelings, memories. And it is the sum total of all of our experiences with form. It comprises our character, which can be both our strengths, skills, and abilities, as well as our neuroses, fears, and negative habit systems. Now the language of the subconscious mind is the language of feelings, pleasure and pain, and everything in between those ends of the spectrum. And emotions that could be described as anger, frustration, sorrow, joy, happiness, annoyance, irritation, etc. And the subconscious operates in the realm of symbols, something we talked about earlier, which tarot cards are based on. The subconscious mind is, just as the conscious mind is the portal to the subconscious, the subconscious becomes the portal to our superconscious mind. And the superconscious mind is the spark of divinity in each of us. We alternately, in metaphysical work, refer to it as the higher self or our higher intelligence. This is you, separate from your neuroses. And this is that part of us that we perceive as I am. And I don't know if any of you have ever had the experience of dreaming, but also being aware that you were dreaming and being able to direct whether you wanted to remain in that dream or move somewhere else. And when you're in that position, you're functioning within your superconscious mind. But it is the part that we recognize as the detached observer, and we can do this in our waking state as well, where we see the events of our lives unfolding, but we also see ourselves as being something that is separate from that. So, all of the extrasensory work, all of the intuitive work that we're going to talk about over the succeeding four weeks is going to bring this um, law into place. Those of you who have studied with me before um, have heard me talk about it. And I'm going to give you a quote from C.C. Singh from the book Laws of Occultism. <clears throat> Man has a physical body and he has an astral body. The physical body and through its nerve currents, which are electrical in nature, his mind or soul, which resides on the inner plane, the small emergent part being the objective mind and the submerged part, the unconscious mind, are influenced by his outer plane environment. His astral body and his mind or soul are influenced by his inner plane environment, and the thought cells so affected in turn influence his body. Thus does man live in and is influenced by both an outer plane world and an inner plane world. So we live in two worlds, each and every one of us. The inner plane we refer to as the astral. This comes to us from the Greek meaning of a star. They called it that because they saw that this realm uh, where our unconscious mind, subconscious and superconscious reside, is receptive to astrological energies. 
The outer plane we call the physical. This is where our bodies reside. They are divided or separated by an etheric boundary line that moves at 186, 172 miles per second. What is that? The speed of light, yes. Everything moving above that speed of light um, is non-physical in nature. And everything moving below the speed of light is physical in nature. The inner plane interpenetrates and has a molding effect over the physical. And to contact the inner plane, we must extend our consciousness from where it normally resides in our physical brain and move it to the inner plane. To do so, we oftentimes have to have adequate electrification, which is what we do through rhythmic breathing. We electrify ourselves to be able to move above that etheric boundary line and to be able to penetrate the inner plane where it's moving at a much faster frequency than the slow moving physical substance. Events happen there first before they happen here. And that's how we get our psychic information. And another quote from uh, Laurent van der Poos in the foreword to the book Jung and Thoreau. The unconscious and conscious exist in a profound state of interdependence of each other, and the well-being of one is impossible without the well-being of the other. So, what we're doing when we move our consciousness to the inner plane to gather information, through our extension of consciousness. We're desiring to know about a certain situation and we're electrifying ourselves so that we can push our consciousness out even for a second to gather that information. What we do is we are tapping into the astral counterpart of either an individual or an object and we will talk about it as being its lifeline or its world line. And in this lifeline, it is perceived as memories. Much as you may recall something you did in your childhood, we perceive both the past and the future as memories. So, it takes um, very careful skill on the part of a reader to be able to direct their consciousness to a very narrow band of information that someone is seeking. These are, these are one of the things that are, is a talent that's only built up over time and through repetitive use of intuitive work. All right, Zane says, the soul or unconscious mind of an individual is the organization and finer than physical substance of the sum total of his past experiences. It and all objects move along this fourth dimension we call time. The line of movement of anything thus through time is called its world line. All back of the now point in each object's or soul's world line is fixed in the time dimensions. Its place at any moment of the past cannot be altered. And when the consciousness is extended to an object or person on the inner plane, this world line can be perceived. And if the attention can be focused on any particular point in that world line, what happened at that time in the past with the details of the conditions affecting it can be perceived. The past is always with us. It, however, is being conditioned in the present moment to bring the future into being. 
So what we perceive as future events when we're doing intuitive work, there is some degree of an ability to alter this, and we'll talk about this over the next few weeks. Sometimes we cannot always change the event, but by knowing of something in advance, uh, we can oftentimes change our relationship to an event. And this is one of those things that quite often, you know, books are written about, stories are written about, what happens if we can, you know, alter the events of history? How, how do the dominoes fall differently? Oops, let's go back. So I didn't talk about that. So, we did discuss this earlier. The subconscious communicates to the conscious through feelings and through symbols. And this is going to relate strongly to the tarot. In esoteric psychology, Zane says, one can hardly locate any point in the evolution of mind where symbols were first used. After all, concrete things cannot exist bodily in the mind. And as a symbol, is that which stands for something. Whatever mental images the mind holds are the symbols of its physical and mental experiences. Those symbols which are now in current use as the words of our language are merely the more complex development of a process that is as old as life itself. So what is a symbol? Symbol is something that represents something else. There are some symbols. What do these represent? Major religions of the world. Now, when we think of something, we either think of its name or its image, or oftentimes we're combining the two. Now, if we are literate, then we are oftentimes thinking of the written form. And writing has taken on two forms around the world. There is either the um, ideogrammatic form. For example, Chinese writing is written in ideograms. They are, are symbols, and you have to have a, uh, an alphabet of over 2,000 letters, or phonetically, where a symbol represents a sound. In our alphabet, I think we have 26 letters coming from the Chaldean and Phoenician alphabets of 22 letters. The thing is, it's not the item that's in our mind. It's the symbol that's in our mind. Know that symbol? It's very helpful when you're out in a public place. Now, a word is a symbol that represents a person, place, object, an action, or an abstract idea. What is that? Fire. Fire. Written language is dependent on symbols. What is that? Campfire. In pictograph writing, a symbol or an ideogram represents a word or idea. Can you guess what that is? Fire. Fire. In phonetic writing, a symbol or letter represents sound. If we're all literate in English, we know what that is. Each of these is telling us the same thing. When we look at this symbol, that symbol, or that, it brings this to mind. So what I'm getting at slowly over these next few weeks is how tarot cards work. What is this? One of our ancestors. All right, human communication.
It's dependent on symbols. We can surmise that early humans communicated with sounds and gestures. Yesterday, I went to make a bank deposit and I went to the drive up booth and the intercom was not working between the inside of that um, drive-in booth and the outside where I was. How did we communicate? We had to do so through symbols. Now, the teller and I had a different symbol set. That, so we had to quickly learn one another's symbols. Much as if early men or women from different clans came into contact with one another. So she was waving by, I gave her a little bow, <laughs> which she then mimicked. And that's how we learned, just as animals learn uh, symbolic language, it's through mimicry. So early art, early human art, um, is based upon symbolism. The hand will see all over the world in rock art because it is the thing, the symbol that makes us human. So animals, humans, uh, prehistoric uh, symbols are frequently found in the form of petroglyphs. Has anyone in this room ever gone out to the petroglyph park? It's a nice place to hike and what you can do is you can see the symbols of early humans. There has been human presence here in New Mexico for a minimum of 10,000 years. And humans have been leaving their marks on those basalt escarpments that are on the um, western edge of Albuquerque. And that's, it is a form of picture writing. All right, Zane says, but here it is only necessary to trace it from its simple beginning as visual pictograph images to the next step, which is the visual symbolical pictograph. Yet the necessity is urgent to make clear at this point that pictographs and symbolical pictographs not only were the first visual images used by the race in the communication of ideas from one to another, but that because they represent obvious associations, they are the images still employed by the unconscious mind. Esoteric psychology. So the American Southwest is filled with examples of picture writing from the ancestral Pueblo people and other um, groups that entered this area. Elements are from the natural world as well as mythic creatures. Now, we are not the only species to use symbols. Gorillas can be taught to use American Sign Language to the level of a three-year-old human. <laughs> It may have been a bad day for the trainer. <laughs> Looked like she meant it too. Uh -huh. <laughs> Mimicry. Mm -hmm. So what Zane said on, on symbolism was, in fact, the policy of the ancient Masons was to mark every discovery of importance relative to the development of human character and the attainment of immortality with an appropriate symbol. Thus, if the symbol should be perpetuated, the discovery would not be lost, even through generations unable to read it past. For to nature's initiates, a symbol is both a diagram and a description of the fact it was selected to represent. Though a universal symbol, such as the ancient masons employed, should be lost to sight for a thousand years, the first keen student of nature's laws to stumble upon it would be able to comprehend its meaning as well as those who first used it, used it first. The study of ancient masonry 
then becomes a study of such universal symbols. We have two different types of symbols, personal symbols and universal symbols. Here are some of the ways that symbols uh, show up in our life, whether it be a Celtic cross, we, what we recognize as the all-seeing eye of God from the dollar bill, the wheel of Dharma, the Masonic compass and square, or the male and female signs. Those are pretty universal symbols. Because symbolical pictographs is the language commonly employed by the unconscious mind to impart information too complex to be expressed merely as feeling, its appeal is universal. Pictorial symbols may be chosen, the common associations of which are the same the world over. In this manner, regardless of changes in arbitrary speech or differences in nationality, an idea can be conveyed to any intelligent people in the world in spite of passing time. All right, the Tarot is written in the language of universal symbolism using symbolical pictographs. And that's what we're learning about over the next four weeks. Now, personal symbolism versus universal symbolism. In universal symbolism, a white horse might have a very specific meaning, purity of thought or movement. These are all different symbols that have been used throughout time. That's in your note. I'll let you read that. Okay, let's start talking about the Tarot. I love this little poem, which is from a very old book I have um, called Old and Curious Wah. Playing Cards. These mystic cards would lift the veil and bid us take a look within. They show us love, ambition, hope with marriage, luck despair and sin. Pope, Empress, Justice, Temperance, even death who mows down all, showing our life is but a dream, a breath whose scythe on all must fall. All right, can anyone pronounce the word? <laughs> Give it a try, come on. Tarot. That's how it's spelled. <laughs> well, where does it come from? Actually entered English from the French. Um, and the word is pronounced Toro. It comes, however, the French is a derivation of tarocchi, which is Italian. Tarocchi is plural for tarocco, for which we have no idea. Now, the original name for tarot cards was triomphi. And you can see in that word triumph, in English, we refer to the major arcanum of the tarot as trumps. However, how many of you play bridge? They still refer to the trumps in bridge games and other card games. Because that comes from their um, past in um, gaming, primarily. Now, tarot history is something that is um, greatly debated. Tarot historians claim that Tarot was originally designed as a parlor game and that the history of Tarot cards 
and playing cards is inseparable. When exploring the origins of Tyrol, we must juggle the folkloric tales against historic evidence, and the real truth may lie somewhere between the two extremes. What we do know from a historic standpoint is that the Tarot first appeared in Europe during the late medieval and the early Renaissance. A common Tarot deck has 78 cards. The 22 major arcanum possibly evolved from the allegorical symbolism of the Hermetic Reformation. The 12 court cards, 36 minor arcanum, and four tens were derivative of older Islamic decks of cards prevalent in Turkey, Spain, and North Africa. So the earliest known taroki uh, appeared in Italy in the mid 15th century. Doesn't mean they didn't exist before that, but we're looking at extant cards. And they were um, produced, I believe, first in leather and then later in um, cardboard, basically pulp. Now, the Visconti Sforza deck from the mid 15th century is the oldest existing uh, deck of tarot cards. So that's the historic side. The esoteric story behind all of this um, comes to us through hermetic oral tradition in which it was suggested that the tarot originated as bas-reliefs in the Egyptian temples of initiation. And they were first mentioned by, the, uh, by Antoine Court de Gablon in 1719 in his book, um, The Primitive World. He, in that book, claims for the first time that tarot means royal road and he's referring to the road of initiation. And he's the first author to describe the Tarot as being a repository of ancient Egyptian knowledge. Now historians tell us that around 1370, playing cards of four suits, swords, wands, cups, and coins, first appeared on the scene in Europe. And these were packs of 52 to 56 playing cards. <clears throat> Speculation exists that they were an Islamic invention that may have entered Europe through crusaders returning home from the Holy Land. The last crusade, however, was over by 1291 uh, which is almost 80 years before European cards are first mentioned by historical documentation. Now that doesn't mean they didn't exist. It just meant that we don't have any writing about them prior to that. And again, that's one of the problems with um, history. The theory that the cards came from the Mamluks of Egypt is now generally accepted on the basis of historical evidence. And in um, 1939, Leo Arie Meyer, who was an Israeli um, archeologist, discovered in the Tokapi Sarai Museum in Istanbul, a complete pack of cards which could be traced to the 12th or 13th century. Early 14th century Italian packs are almost identical to the Mameluk playing cards. And they consist of 52 cards of four suits, swords, polo sticks, cups, and coins. The cards include numerals from one to 10, 
and three courts, king, deputy king, and under deputy. So the question is, did the cards enter Europe through Italy or Spain? Well, it's most likely that cards were brought into Spain by the Moors. Uncut sheets of cards discovered in Barcelona and dated to the 15th century show a close similarity to the Mamluk cards. However, Italy remains a possibility as cards, like any other goods, followed major trade routes and Venice was the main trade gate into Europe. Another argument for Italy is that early Italian cards strongly resemble the Mameluke cards. <coughs> and the Moors were also in Sicily for a period of time. Now we go to one of the other complicated issues. Numbering of cards. The earliest trionfi are not numbered. So the current accepted order of the major arcanum was not established until the Tarot of Marseille was designed. Prior to 17th century, Spanish, Italian, Persian, and Indian cards had very curious rankings. Swords and wands, now known as spades and clubs, were ordered king, queen, knight, jack, ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, and ace. And in the suits of cups and coins, or hearts and diamonds, they were ordered king, queen, jack, knight, jack, ace, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. Now the Tarot of Marseille is loosely based on an older deck, which is known as the Tarot of Lombardy. And the greatest difference is in the ordering of the cards. So here you can see Arcanum 7 in the Tarot of Lombardy is known as Justice, in the Tarot of Marseille, the Chariot. Arcanum 8 in Lombardy is the Chariot, and in Marseille is Justice. Arcanum 9 is Fortitude in Lombardy, and the Hermit in the Tarot of Marseille. And Arcanum 11 was the Hermit in Lombardy, and Fortitude in the Tarot of Marseille. So when we start to compare tarot decks, and in this class, because there'll be people in class that work with different decks, and I welcome you to bring your decks to class, we want to be able to learn the tarot as a set of symbols and cross-reference. Although I teach pretty much specifically from the Brotherhood of Light tarot deck, I strongly recommend that one learn a system and learn it well, and then you can start learning other systems once you have a firm foundation in a deck. Now, in contemporary tarot cards, the greatest difference in the numbering of the tarot arcanum is um, a difference between the hermetic um, Brotherhood of Light and the Golden Dawn tradition. So you'll find in, for example, the weight cards um, in the Golden Dawn tradition, which is um, A.E. Waite and his successors, uh, Paul Foster Case and other authors, they follow a particular numeric succession. So in those systems, the biggest difference is Arcanum 8, in Zane's deck, it's the balance or justice, and you'll find that in many of the older tarot cards. In the weight deck, it's fortitude or strength. Uh, Arcanum 11 is the enchantress, also known as fortitude or strength, and um, in the weight deck, it's justice. Now, what happens with these changes 
is tarot cards are also um, associated with numeric symbolism. So we draw sometimes part of our interpretations off of numbers. So when they're changed, that can affect the way in which we interpret them. And for Kabbalists, the major arcanum of the tarot are associated with the Hebrew lettering system. So when you change the cards around, then the alphabet is sort of being rearranged on you. Another reason why you, you work and pick with a set, but you'll see as we go along, one could, once they've learned symbolism, you could pick up a deck of cards from the casino up here and read from those if you needed to. So let's talk a little bit about um, medieval Spain. The Spanish and Italian cards, if you ever have access to them, even around here, um, sometimes in the dollar stores or other places, you can find naipes, which are the Spanish playing cards. And the symbols in Spanish and Italian cards use the traditional suits of coins, cups, swords, and clubs or wands. <coughs> However, this was not the case through the rest of Europe. Depending on what region you came from, uh, the suits changed. So, in the Germanic countries, they were acorns, bells, leaves, and hearts. And there are some early um, Germanic woodcuts. However, some of the best um, card engravers were in the Low Countries. They were Netherlandish and um, German engravers. The Mediterranean cultures, Spain, Italy, France, did not adorn their minor arcanum. And it was actually uh, German card makers that started to cover the lower halves of their cards with vignettes of some type. And I believe this later influenced the work of A.E. Waite and Pamela Coleman Smith when they designed what we commonly call the weight deck, which is actually the most popular deck of tarot cards. I started reading with those first when I was 13, and I found the minor arcanums very hard to understand, because oftentimes the, the number and suit seemed to be so contrary to what was being pictured on the card. It was really confusing to me. I find um, the traditional cards easier to read than those that have pictures because pictures bring up uh, symbols and images. In 1470, French card makers introduced the contemporary suits of clubs, diamonds, spades, and hearts. These suits most widely used today were developed in 15th century France by Etienne de Vignon, better known as the Knight La Ia, who was an avid supporter of Jean d'Arc, uh, whose face, and not Jean d'Arc, but uh, Lahir, was used for the Jack of Hearts. And the French simplified the deck of cards into two colors, red and black. Sound familiar? <clears throat> for the suits, thus making them easier to stencil, lowering production costs, and making a more affordable and easily distributed deck. What's the other advantage of, again, not so much from divination standpoint, but when you're playing card games, of easily recognizable cards? If you're playing a game where you have to act fast, the quicker you can recognize what cards in your hand, 
um, the better off you are. Visually, we as humans can only recognize up to four objects. So we have to start arranging cards in patterns to recognize five and six. And usually we're grouping them into two groups of three or two groups of four or a four and a three in order to recognize it instantaneously. So by the end of the Thirty Years' War, German domination of the card market had declined. French deck won out for gambling games. And this formed the basis of modern playing cards. Why am I telling you about modern playing cards? Because the history of playing cards and the history of the tarot are um, inextricably intertwined with one another. Recognize these? We all do. And this is the lasting influence of the French. So cards entered England between 1400 and 1463. Um, 15th century, Belgium and French card manufacturers are exper exporting barrels of cards. And the English adopted the French pips, but canceled, called some of them by the older names. What is this? What is a spade? Mm -hmm. Does anyone garden here? Anyone own a spade? But it actually comes from the Spanish. Espada, which means sword. In English, as English is wont to do with foreign languages, it bastardizes them into whatever's convenient for pronunciation. What's that? Heart. Does that look like a club to you? Would you club somebody with that? No. That looks like a clover to me. That's a trefoil, a three-leafed clover. And this? A diamond. Well, French called these picks, spear points, which represented espadas, swords. Cour heart was the symbol for cups. Uh, Caro, floor tiles for coins. They weren't really diamonds. And the treff or trefoil. Uh, is called clubs in English, after bastoni, or cudgels, or clubs. So, we believe that the four suits represents the four seasons, or the four elements. This also varies between whether one studies the cards from the tradition of the Hermetic Brotherhood of Light or from the tradition of the Hermetic Brotherhood of Dawn. And it becomes very confusing if one has learned it in one tradition and then finds in another tradition the symbols are different. But coins, which became diamonds, are also known as disc or pentacles. And they represent the season of spring, new life. Uh, in the Brotherhood of Light, they represent air. Um, air, you can go for maybe many days, probably a couple weeks without food. You might be able to go for three days without water before you die. You can't go for more than five or ten minutes without air. Sorry, you're brain dead if you do that. So air was considered to be the most valuable uh, nutrient form, uh, the, the gift of life itself. So it evolved into the, what we valued, which was money, an element of social exchange, and it evolved into the suit of diamonds. 
However, in the Golden Dawn tradition, it's considered to be the element of Earth, and this will create some confusion and crossover from one tradition to the next. Coins. Didn't we just do this? Ah, here is from the Sacred Tarot. And even as heralded in the verses of Omar, the spring is signaled by the rose. In certain older cards, the rose is sometimes found. The spring is a period of renewed life, and thus the rose, as representing it in some mystical orders, is the symbol of a renewed life. Spring brought a new food supply which nourished life, but this food supply by which life might be sustained also might be purchased. As thus we have the pieces of money, the coins of the tarot, but in later days a more commercial age decided that for sustaining life through trade, diamonds were even more precious than money, so in modern cards we have the suit of diamonds. Now, who would think that floor tiles were more precious than <laughs> money? <clears throat> Scepters can be called wands or clubs or cudgels or bastoni. They represent summer. And what do we know about the summer? Hot. And the ancients decided that the element of fire um, represented the summer heat. And it could be recreated through burning wood. The scepters, when we read Tarot, almost exclusively relate to things having to do with one's business or reputation. And they evolved eventually into the suit of clubs. Here, Zane says, the summer that brought the trefoil, or three-leafed clover, which was important for the forage to the flocks of a pastoral people, so the clover became associated with the heat of summer. A similar heat could be produced with wood, and thus scepters came to be the symbol of summer heat, and are so represented in the tarot. Moderns, however, continue to picture the clover, but refer to the wood, still calling it the suit of clubs. Cups. Called cups. One thing we all agree upon is represent the time of autumn, which is the time of celebration. What happens in fall? Anybody live in Harvest and anybody live in wine country ever? The first crush. Bernalillo just celebrated its wine festival, uh, one of the older wine growing regions in New Mexico. So, autumn was the time of harvest and celebration. It corresponded the cups to the element of water, which is love or the emotions. We can easily see how that evolved into the suit of hearts. And Zane says, the autumn, when the wine was pressed from the grape, came to be the season of festivities, of dancing and of marriage. To represent the emotions thus engendered, the cup from which the wine was quaffed came to be used, and thus is still one of the suits of the tarot. But moderns associating the emotions of joy and those that result in marriage with the heart have preferred to use them in picturing the corresponding suit of playing cards. Swords, espadas in Spanish, represent winter, hardship, and the element of earth. The spade you use to dig beneath the surface of the earth to find food in winter. It became the symbol in the tarot of either strife or of practicality, those things in life that we have to somewhat endure. And it evolved into the suit of spades. This is again confusing between 
B of L and Golden Dawn in that B of L, um, the positions are different. Um, this is the element of air. So Zane's description for this is, the winter was a time of dearth and want. To provide for this period when no food could be garnered, it was customary to work hard to gather and hoard a supply sufficient to last through until spring. And it was observed that the oak also thus provided a food supply, which was similarly stored by squirrels. Thus the acorn came to be used as the symbol of winter. But in time, the afflictions of winter and the struggle to sustain life, especially as it often led to strife among peoples, came to be depicted by the emblem of strife, the sword. Yet a still later people looked upon this unfruitful season as the cause of their unceasing toil, and to depict this used the modern symbol of toil, the shovel or spade, as it is called in modern playing cards. All right, let's see. Uh, we'll talk about this later, the inner meanings. In the B of L cards, we have inner and outer meanings. The outer meanings are derived from numeric symbolism and suit. The inner meanings are derived from the deaconates, which are each of the 10 degree constellations um, associated with the cards. And those are always pictured in the upper corner here, but we don't have time tonight to go into that in detail. Tarot decks have 78 cards. Modern playing cards have 52 cards. What they lack are four horsemen and the 22 major arcanum. You can still read with them, though, in a pinch. You might not get all the important information, but you can get information. When one is familiar with symbolism of suits and numbers, standard playing cards can be used in divination. All right, what does the tarot have to do with intuition? Tarot cards are a divinatory tool. And the word divination comes from the Latin divinare, meaning to be inspired by a divinity or to be inspired by a god. It also has come down uh, to represent um, foreseeing the future. Divination of any kind uh, often involves the use of symbolic or oracular objects, which are randomly cast. Next week, we're going to talk about the process. How is it that we get information from something that's randomly cast? Uh, the mind of the diviner draws correlations between the symbols, their positions, and future events. Here's the process of divination, and Zane says in The Doctrine of Divination, divination is the act of foreseeing or foretelling future events or discovering information not accessible through the exercise of reason and the ordinary physical senses. Sounds like intuition to me. Does anyone recognize that image? Very good. On a, um, a Greek platter. That is the Oracle of Delphi, who sat in her cave in Delphi, sacred to Apollo, and would utter abstract comments that were written down verbatim. And uh, throughout Greek history, um, meanings were extracted from these story she would tell or poetry that would come out of her. What's he using here? <clears throat> Crystal ball. There's another form of divination where one might stare into a bright shining object, be it a crystal ball, a blackened mirror, um, a bowl of water, a quartz crystal, or a flame. But the process of 
of focusing on a bright object often can bring about the process of clairvoyance where one sees on that object, uh, even though it looks a little cornball here, <laughs> but one can see the pictures of things unfolding. What's he doing? He's holding what we call a divining rod. For dowsing, right? Dowsing. When I was a teenager, I lived in Northern California in an area that was inhabited by the Pomo Indians. And there was what we called a well witch among the Indians, who was, when you were ready to dig a well, he's the person that would come out with his willow rod and would determine the best place to um, have your well drilled. He could also, from the tubs on the rod, determine how many feet um, to go down, that you'd have to drill down in order to find water. Um, this was not a trained geologist. <laughs> Thus, he was called a witch, because he always found water. But he could find other things with this rod. And one day, uh, he grabbed a strand of my, what was very long hair at the time, and tied it around the end of his divining rod, um, blindfolded himself, and sent us all off scattering in different directions. And the rod took him to where I was hiding. <coughs> Does anyone know what these are? Yeah, they're used in the process of eaching, where either coins or yarrow sticks are thrown down. The patterns, um, they are a binary system, which is what the brain works on and what most computers work on, computers being zero or one. But they form patterns from which an oracle is read. These? Rooms. And they have symbols on them, which bring up information to the mind of the reader, who casts them down randomly. I've also seen it be done with colored stones, where each stone is given a different symbolism and meaning, and readers that use this form of divination can, um, from the position, the stone, what colors are in proximity to one another, they get information. Uh, this is um, divination by Ifa, which is used in West Africa among the Yoruba tribe, and in the in the cup here, they have cowrie shells, which have two faces to them: the open face, which looks like teeth, and then the rounded surface. And on this special board they will cast down the cowrie shells, much like the system of the I Ching, whether they're right side up or face down, bring up information to the reader. And again, it's a, you have to be very trained in these systems uh, in order for them to work. This is also a West African tradition. Uh, there is a crab in a bowl, and this particular diviner um, is able to <coughs> excuse me, answer questions based on the way in which the crab moves around in the bowl. And I guess if it doesn't perform properly, it ends up as somebody's dinner. In the 19th century, there was phrenology, reading the lumps on one's there is also chiromancy, which is the reading of the lines in palms as a form of divination. And um, has anyone ever had their coffee grounds read? Well, in case you don't do coffee, there's also tea leaves, which can be read. So there's any number of tools which are used as divination. But they all pretty much use the same process. The tarot cards are just one form of accessing extrasensory perception using a divinatory tool. 
So, recommended reading is in your list. Oh, these are really small. So, some of these books, these are actually just many of the books that I have read over time that I think are really valuable. You don't have to go out and get them all, but if you decide you want to write a doctorate in the subject, you might want some of these. Um, but there, there are good things out there, and you may find, they're all on your list, you may find things that um, appeal to you or not. Uh, the books that I most recommend we have up here are The Sacred Tarot by C.C. Sane. There is a book by Doris J. Stone, Blending Astrology, Numerology, and Tarot. There's also Secret Symbolism of the Tarot by Doris J. Stone. And these are out of the tradition in which I teach. You do not have to have any of the books to be in class. They're here and available for your purchase. We'll have them every week, as well as any number of other things in our bookstore if you um, decide you want um, to do books. Any questions on Tarot, ESP, Psychic Senses, how the class is organized? Yes. Um, kind of a waking dream experience, would you call that more of a feeling or an intellectual? Well, it would, it would depend because quite often our, our waking dreams are visual. When we're daydreaming, we're having visual imagery. And sometimes, what's hard to determine sometimes, and, and again, one of the reasons that we might choose to use a divinatory instrument over just sitting there and saying whatever came to our head, is sometimes it is hard to discern the difference between fantasy thinking and actual intuitive perception. And it's actually more helpful to other people when we're able to give them an accurate intuitive perception as opposed to a, a fantasy that may be coming up in our mind. So clairvoyance. If you are actually seeing an event unfold that you later find out to be true, whether it's something that happened at a distance, something that happened in the past, or something that happened in the future, and when you arrive at that time, uh, you recognize it. Another thing that many people experience is what's called um, deja vu, or to have seen something before. And this is something that I had a lot as a child and still have. And what I've discovered from that is I used to always expect it to mean something important. But all it really means is you're seeing something before it happened. But oftentimes in deja vu, what's happening is we dream, but we dream our memories of the future. And then when the event unfolds, we start to recognize it as a memory of something, which because we've dreamt it in advance, it's almost as though we were pulling up a memory from the past. So that's another experience, but one can oftentimes, with deja vu, want to assign, you know, great import, oh, this must mean something's going to happen. No, you ate a taco. <laughs> uh, I think it's important to discuss is sometimes knowing about things in advance don't improve the situation. But I have heard from people at other times it does, that it can soften the blow or it can bring your attention to something ahead of time. You know, knowing, knowing those things, you can alter your behavior. But as I've gotten older, I've come to the conclusion that we relatively have very um, little, uh, oftentimes we cannot impact the events of our lives by knowing about them in advance. We have to go through the experience. But what I do believe, I, I cannot control the weather. I was just in California for nine days, and if I could control the weather, uh, it would not have been as humid as it was. 
but I having no power over that um, couldn't do anything about it. So what could I do? I could dress appropriately, which even at times was not that much. You know, in my youth, taking clothes off may have been an exciting thing, but, you know, at this point, there's a, a minimum of, you know, clothing I want to take off. So, um, you, you adjust. There are certain things in our life where we may not be able to control the event, and therefore, all we can do is to try and carefully control our relationship to an event. And sometimes the only thing it boils down to is our mental outlook and how we take that with us to an event. So in next week's class, we're going to talk a bit about that, why, why, why things happen. And um, we'll go in more into the process of divination with tarot cards and how that works. If there are no more questions, and uh, for those in class, see you next week. It will only get more interesting. Thank you for coming. Thank you.